it's, it's, a, it's consists of 64 dishes. Uh, and on the left hand side of the screen here, you can see the dish layout. You can see that a large number of dishes here, approximately 70% of them are in the central core. And then you can see these small red circles, which are sort of moving out up to eight kilometer distance. And these are like far away dishes here. So what this uh, central concentration of dishes gives this telescope is a lot of sensitivity to map large scale diffuse emission in the sky. And this telescope is located in South Africa, in a, in a desert in South Africa. So this remote location implies that it has got very less radio frequency interference. This is an issue which is very important for radio telescopes, any radio telescope, including our own GMRT, which is located close to Pune, that we have to build these telescopes at location where we don't uh, face much radio frequency interference. Talking about Mirke telescope specifically, it has got two receivers. One is L-band. And uh, which covers frequency 900 to 1670 megahertz. And another receiver is called UHF band, and that covers 580 to 1015 megahertz. Now, for H121 centimeter and OH18 centimeter lines, which are the prime tracers of our survey, this corresponds to redshift range of uh, coverage of approximately 0 to 2. You can see the breakdown here uh, in these uh, on the slide itself. And uh, the way we are observing with it, this telescope is that we, we, we use one of the receivers which will take data from this entire frequency range. But this entire bandwidth is then split into 32K, 32,000 uh, frequency channels, right? So, so this is a large number of frequency channels. And then at every eight second, we acquire data, which means that, uh, uh, and, and what is the data in this case? The data in this case is called visibilities, in, in which case what we are doing is that we are, we are taking signal from each of the, and antennas and combining them in pairs. So NC2 pairs will be uh, coming at every eight second. And plus we are also taking data for all four polarization modes that's like uh, so so into four. So what this means that there's a lot, a lot of data that is flowing uh, from the telescope. In, in approximately one hour, we accumulate one terabyte of data, right? So this, uh, this is the first uh, glimpse of data challenge that uh, I, I will describe more in detail later, but 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 you can keep this number in your mind that every one hour we are actually producing uh, uh, one terabyte of data. And for our survey, we have got uh, total observing time of 1655 hours. So just the raw data volume will be corresponding to 1.5 petabytes, right? And uh, and the way survey will be carried out is that we will use L band receiver and observe approximately 450 pointings, and then about the same number of pointings we will observe using the UHF band, right? So at the end of the survey, we are expecting we will have close to 1.7 petabytes produced in South Africa over a period of three to four years. All this data now has to be brought at IUCA uh, periodically, and then has to be processed, right, to produce the kind of images and spectra that I'm going to show you in subsequent slides. But what? But before going into all that, what is the main goal of the survey? The main goal of the survey is to probe the evolution of cold gas in galaxies. And I'm talking here about normal galaxies as well as active galaxies, that is AGN, which have got an active black hole at the center of the galaxy. And on the left-hand panel, you can see uh, a plot which, is, which shows the evolution of star formation rate density of the universe as a function of redshift, right? And in the previous slide, I was telling you that uh, it, we are going to use H121 centimeter and OH18 centimeter lines uh, over this redshift range, right? So, so our idea is that these lines of H1 and OH are excellent tracers of cold atomic and molecular gas. And what we are going to do through this survey is to uh, trace the trace the evolution of a coal atomic and molecular gas content of galaxies over this redshift range, where this rapid evolution in star formation rate and agent activity is observed, right? And this is something which is not uh, very well constrained right now. So through this survey, we want to constrain the evolution of uh, the coal uh, gas in galaxies. Plus, we also want to understand how this coal gas is then influencing the evolution of star formation and agent activity. So, so that's the headline goal of the survey. And as you would know from basic physics that when we are talking about cold atomic and molecular gas, such gaseous environments will are also accompanied by dust, which means that if you would have carried out such a survey at optical or ultraviolet wavelength, then it will be very difficult for you to look at these regions because they will be obscured by dust, right? So this is a, another advantage uh, that why we want to do this survey at radio wavelengths using these uh, radio spectral line tracers is that at radio, the radio wavelengths are being longer 
compared to optical ultraviolet, they are unaffected by dust obscuration, right? So we can really actually get an unbiased view of, uh, of the universe in this case. So uh, I, I will first describe uh, how, uh, what, what's the main probe that we are using in these uh, observations. The main idea is that if you have got a distant bright source, it could be an EGN, for example, a quasar at, at a very high redshift. So when light from this quasar actually travels and reaches an observer, in between it will pass through all kinds of matter that is there in the universe, right? You can see all these uh, like un over densities, these uh, regions where a lot of galaxies are present. So what would happen that when you obtain a spectrum of uh, an AGN like this, then this spectrum will also contain an imprint of the intervening matter. For example, in the spectrum which is shown here in the screen, you can see that there are various absorption lines that are produced in the spectrum. And there is one particular absorption line which is very strong, and that is called damp flammable phi absorption. Such absorbers correspond to column densities less than 10 to 20 per centimeter square. Why such absorbers or such column densities are of interest? Because these are the column densities that we see associated with the disks of nearby galaxies. So which means that whenever you are seeing such an absorber here in your spectrum, it is actually passing through a uh, very close to a galaxy. So looking, so so this, so without detecting galaxy directly by this technique, you can actually look at very distant galaxies, which you wouldn't be able to see otherwise, right? Because you just again from very simple uh, physics, you, you you know that as I move a certain source away from us, its flux will go down as one by r square, uh, and and at some point it will go below the detection limit of my telescope. But when we use this technique, such a limitation does not arise because I am looking at these sources in absorption, right? So it's also a very, not just a dust unbiased uh, way of looking at universe when we are looking at it in radio wavelengths, but it is also a very luminosity unbiased way of looking at galaxies. So it will give us a very unbiased way of uh, galaxy evolution. That's the idea. And here you can see a zoom in view of how a damp flammable phi absorber looks like. And if we can look at 21 centimeter OH line in uh, corresponding to this, that will tell us that how much of the gas is cold, like close to 100 Kelvin, and what is the molecular gas fraction in this galaxy uh, or, or along this side line. And, and why this is important? Because we know that like it is the cold atomic and molecular gas that is the basic fuel for star formation, right? So like that, we can make the connection between star formation and the cold gas that is present in the galaxy. So, so, so now you can visualize that why we want to uh, use this technique to you, uh, study how a cold gas is evolving in galaxies then and how it can be then related to the evolution of star formation rate density. Now a little bit of uh, just uh, how we can plan a survey like this. You can look at uh, this equation at the bottom, especially delta x. So when we're talking about absorption line surveys, we define this quantity called uh, uh, co-moving path length. What it consists of two parts here. You can look, see g here, right? G is called the sensitivity function. What this contains, or this is telling you, is that when uh, Regardless of which instrument we are using, we will take, let's say we take a spectra co uh, covering some frequency range, then my spectra will have some variable sensitivity across it, right? Maybe per, uh, perhaps because my telescope's sensitivity is actually varying as a function of uh, frequency so from a simple reason like that. So this sensitivity function actually contains the information that in certain parts of spectrum, I will have uh, a limited sensitivity to detect only absorption of strength, uh, strength greater than certain value, right? So this information is contained in this, and the second uh, factor is just the underlying cosmology. So when we plan a survey like this, what we want to do is to we want to maximize the co-moving path length of the survey. And this is basically what represents your uh, overall yield from the survey. So currently, up to this point, the surveys that have been carried out at radio wavelengths to search for H1 and 21 centimeter H1 or OH uh, lines, they have had uh, certain uh, co-moving path length. Miles will have a co-moving path length which is 10 to 100 times larger than existing surveys. So, so, so with this survey, we are trying to do something which has not been done before, which has not, which is much better than what has been done before, right? So that's the idea. So now a little bit what kind of data that comes from a radio telescope and how we, uh, and what kind of images that we can make from it. So if I go back a few slides here, I was showing you uh, a view of the Meerkat telescope. You can see that it's not, Although we call it a telescope, it's not actually just a single a unit. It's actually made up of a large number of dishes here. In this case, 64 offset Gregorian dishes. 
And what we are doing here is that we are collecting what's called visibilities, which is nothing but we are taking voltages from each of these antenna and combining them in pair. That's what NC2 pairs I was talking about, right? So as I am collecting this data, these raw visibilities, what I have to do first thing is to remove bad data from this because there can be, for example, radio frequency interference or my telescope was malfunctioning at some point. So there can be some small bits and pieces bad here and there, right? It's uh, something which needs to be identified. And if you are collecting one terabyte of data in one hour and you have 1655 hours of data, then you have to have uh, your uh, uh, statistical tools and algorithms in place to be able to flag it efficiently without as little human intervention as possible. Once you do that, then you have to calibrate this data. Calibration, again, all of you will be knowing from your uh, various lab experiments and some of you are also doing research. And uh, then uh, calibration is just uh, the effect, uh, the step we are going to re remove the atmospheric and instrumental effects, right? Once we do that, we have what is then called calibrated visibilities. Then we have to weight them appropriately. Uh, this is something which we can discuss in the end if people are interested. Once we appropriately weight these visibilities, then I can take a Fourier transform of these that will give me an image, right? But that image is still not the image that you would want to do science with because you know that uh, each telescope has something called a point spread function, right? You, it is exactly same as what kind of artifacts that you would see in optical image, right? You see it, the spike shaped diffraction patterns that you see in optical images at uh, close in optical images for very bright sources, right? It's exactly the same kind of point spread function effect will be present in the radio images also. And so what we do is called the deconvolution, right? So that this exercise of flagging, calibration, then doing Fourier transform, and then the deconvolution, right? These All these four steps are computationally very, very intensive, right? In, in, in each of these st steps, we can uh, uh, employ different uh, data partitioning schemes. Some parts can be CPU limited, some part can be IO limited. So we have to design our pipeline uh, very, very carefully, uh, understanding the kind of data flow that we are anticipating and the kind of images that we want to make, right? And through this talk, I'm going to tell you that it, uh, the data processing that we do is, is, is very, uh, the, the entire planning for that has to happen uh, by keeping in mind the kind of science we want to do, right? So, so, so both go hand in hand, right? So you're, you're planning for data processing and you're planning for science. You cannot uh, do them in silo, right? So let us say I have done all these things like I have come up to deconvolution, but then even then I can make two kinds of images. As I was describing that for MeCat, we are taking uh, images using these two receivers, L band and UHF band, but I'm taking data such that each this whole band is actually split into 32K frequency channels, right? This frequency channel uh, separation actually corresponds to a frequency resolution of five kilometers per second, right? This is the kind of resolution you would want when you want to resolve spectral lines, these kind of features where you, which you are seeing in the spectra here, right? But then there are two different kinds of signs you can do uh, uh, when you're observing galaxies and uh, AGN. Uh, one is that you can uh, look at their broad spectral behavior, right? How the flux density, for example, of an ATN is changing as a function of frequency. You're not interested in looking at spectral lines in this case. That science is called continuum science. And that in, in that also you need to know uh, the spectral behavior of flux density because that allows you to distinguish between what is the underlying physical process that is giving rise to that uh, uh, a radio emission, it could be synchrotron, it could be free free emission, right? It, it, and, and, and variety of other physical processes that can also contribute. So when you're doing that kind of interest in that kind of science, you could make an image, which is what I'm showing here in screen. It is called a continuum image. In this case, what I can do is that I can average my data in frequency to, uh, let's say, instead of 32K channels, I can average it down to just maybe about 2K or 4K channels. and not much information will be lost because I, I'm not interested in spectral line uh, details in this case. And second kind of uh, imaging that I can do is that I can actually, instead of uh, 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 averaging down data and making this uh, continuum image uh, from the entire data set, I can make an image every per frequency channel, right? So that is called spectral line imaging. And in that case, I, I will have this huge cube that I can take uh, slices at each of these locations, each of the sources, for example, that you are seeing here in your image, 
and I will have a spectra for each of the pixels that we have. Now you can ask the question that if I can make this channel by channel image, then why? what is the need to even make this uh, wideband confirm image? Because the reason here is that when you're making this wideband confirm image, you are averaging entire band. So you get your you, you get a major boost in the sensitivity here, right? Although you are losing spectral information, you're getting a boost in the sensitivity. So if, if you're averaging 32K channels, your sensitivity will be improved by approximately square root of 32K, right? That's, and, and you will be then able to detect very faint sources, which will not be otherwise detected in channel by channel image, right? So, so, so there are different kinds of science that you would do with both kinds of image and the data processing channel that you, uh, uh, have to face in making both these kind of images are different, but basic problems that you would face uh, or basic considerations that you have while making both the types of images are similar. One is that you have to take into account frequency dependent effects here, right? What is the simple frequency dependent effect I talked about? One is that like your response of instrument is changing as a frequency. And another thing that you know is that your uh, and any optical device that you take, it's a uh, field of view it changes as a function of wavelength. Like you remember lambda by D, right? So as I'm going towards lower frequency, the field of view of my telescope is changing. So in this case, what will happen that uh, my uh, telescope is actually seeing more and more uh, larger and larger portion of the sky. So this kind of effects you have to take into account. And second type of effect that you have to take into account, what is called the direction dependent effects, which means that you, I, I talked about point spread function that we have to take into account uh, by, through deconvolution, right? Now, uh, simplistically, you can say that like okay, I have to just uh, know what the point spread function is, and that is something which I can remove from uh, each of the locations in my image. But this point spread function can actually vary across the field of view. Right? That's one thing. So, so, so that is an operation which is very computationally very uh, intensive. That to first to estimate what is the point spread function at different locations, and then to remove its effect correctly. Right? Right. So that is the part you have to also take into account. And then of course, if you are observing at much lower frequencies, then you know that longer wavelengths couple more strongly with ionosphere, then even within your field of view, there may be ionospheric effects that you have to take into account as well, right? So these are various effects that uh, you have to take into account when you're imaging at radio wavelengths. They are all computationally very intensive. So I, I hope with these very simplistic uh, description, I've convinced you that we, not only that we are dealing with large data volumes here, we are, we are also dealing with uh, various computation steps which are which are very, very intensive, right? So, so it's a very big challenge. But this is something which is becoming very, very common. Uh, all of us who are doing radio astronomy have to deal with these things. What you're seeing here is an image uh, made from an L-band pointing of mouse. It is just one hour of integration. And the RMS that we are getting here is like 15 megajansky, right? So this is averaging entire 32K channels. You get this image, right? In this case, and you can see there are more than 4,000 sources in this. And what is the meaning of this fact that we are reaching an RMS of 15 megajansky per beam? If you reach this kind of sensitivity, it means that you're seeing radio emission from both star forming galaxies as well as AGN. And if you're actually looking at a simple, take a simple thumb rule, about 50% of the sources in this image actually are glowing because of the simple star formation uh, processes and not the AGN activity. Okay, so this means that using these spectrum images, we can actually probe not just AGN, but also star forming galaxies as well. Talking about mass specifically, we, uh, at the end of the survey, we will have a thousand uh, degree square view of the sky through, with this sensitivity that is a very large catalog to uh, study uh, AGN and star formation activity in universe. Now I'm going to again make a connection back to uh, uh, spectral line goals of our survey because that's the focus of my talk today. So uh, as I said, in this four, uh, image, there are 400, 4,000 sources, but about 100 of them are actually brighter than 1 millijansky, right? And these become suitable targets to look for H1 and OH absorption lines. Why we are taking only these brighter sources? Because the detection or detectability of absorption signal depends on the, crucially on the strength of the background source, right? The stronger the source, more uh, lower uh, optical depth uh, you can probe. So simply if you just look at, uh, as I was talking about, we are interested in column densities like of DLA, and we are talking about detecting gas, which is like as cold as 100 Kelvin. So if you do simple sum, you can find that the sources which are brighter than one millijansky for which we can get this kind of column density sensitivity 
from the mal survey right so this is what we are trying to do for for each pointing will be centered at a very bright source of or uh, about 200 milligens ki but then there will also be this numerous other uh, close to 100 uh, 1 milligens ki sources are brighter from towards which we will be able to look at how the cold gas is evolving on the right hand side i am showing you one of the projects that uh, my phd student is doing he is looking at uh, he will be looking at 200000 agents detected from the survey and his goal is to look at uh, this entire sample and and relate the cold gas content of agents with the uh, with various properties of the agent for example the luminosity and accretion mode and up to this point uh, in this plot if you see i have also shown here the points uh, what has been uh, studied uh, in the literature by different groups and you can see that uh, in literature about 500 observations are available whereas like in the lower and the bottom curve here, lower and upper curve here show the parameter space that will be explored by mars so 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 we are going to make a very big jump in our understanding of cold gas evolution in uh, agn through this project so uh, i have been talking a little bit about uh, like this survey being just uh, unbiased uh, but but we have to still select like which parts of the sky to look at right and that is something uh, which is done much very efficiently by looking at existing radio and optical surveys so you can ask question that if we are deciding which portions of the sky to look at on the basis of optical and uh, optical surveys for example then it could bias my survey again and that this just unbiased characteristic can be lost so what we have done for our survey is actually to to actually define its footprint using mid infrared uh, wavelengths because similar to radio wavelengths mid infrared wavelengths are also unaffected by dust so in this plot uh, this plot is quite interesting you, there, there are two things happening here if uh, what i have plotted here on y axis and x axis is the y colors uh, at mid, mid infrared and what mid infrared colors do is that they allow you to separate agn from uh, other type of sources like stars right so very easily you can separate them and another thing that you can do using mid infrared colors is that you can also select sources to be preferentially at certain higher redshifts if you look at this color bar you can see that like uh, sources at higher redshifts are localized in this region so what we are doing for mals is actually to select sources which would be preferentially at a certain higher redshift because again like if you if i take you back to this equation here Uh, we want to maximize delta x here, which which would be maximized for the intervening material if I select sources at as much higher redshift as possible, right? So that's the basic idea here through this. So this so through this exercise, this is the mal's footprint you can look at here. So plus various pluses that are there in the screen is actually defining the mal's footprint. Each plus represents where a potential mal's uh, pointing would be. and the square ones are the pointings which we have already observed so there are about 450 pointings at using l band receivers that we have already observed uh, which means that already about uh, half a petabyte of data which we have brought in at iuka over last one year and that is currently being processed another thing uh, this, this slide demonstrates demonstrate is that we have an excellent uh, uh, synergy with various other optical surveys that are that are taking place right now because uh, as i will show you in subsequent slides that uh, e e even though we want to uh, do the best that we can at radio wavelengths but to derive uh, to understand the entire picture that what is happening with a particular let's say agn or a galaxy you want to combine the entire information at other wavelengths also because only then you can understand uh, how that galaxy looks like or what kind of agn it is and what kind of physical processes that may be taking place in it so before going into mals i want to illustrate uh, some of the points uh, related to target selection that i was talking about these are some very quick in interesting points so i was telling you that we have actually selected our targets on the basis of uh, mid infrared colors here but then even like you don't want but there is uh, but there is only certain probability that a source which you select here is at a certain redshift right It, it it it's not guaranteed right because this is in statistical inference there so what we do, have done in addition is that we have carried out a large program with uh, two optical telescopes salt and not to confirm redshifts of a large number of these radio sources where our pointings will be centered and as i and and, and you can see here like uh, through these uh, in, in on the left hand panels what i'm showing here is actually 
the black uh, curves, uh, the wiggly curves are the ones which are coming from the literature, which is where people have selected targets on the basis of optical colors. And the blue ones are the curves which we have selected actually using our uh, survey, right? So you can see that like these, uh, uh, through our mid infrared selection, we are actually probing underlying quasar population in a much better way because that is simply because we have a much less uh, test bias. And other thing is that since we are selecting all the sources to be very bright in radio, and we know uh, that such sources are actually associated with supermassive black holes. That's that's another thing which you can see here in the in the second panel here. And another thing that we are, are achieving through this exercise is that uh, we are looking at sources which are now fainter in optical. They are dust unbiased, but they are very bright in radio, which means that they have got very high radio loudness. Radio loudness is the parameter which is a measure of how much a source. It is actually a ratio of the flux density at a radio wavelength and an optical wavelength, right? So higher radio loud. So, so we are selecting sources which are very, very radio loud here. You can select. And this is a comparison being made with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is currently the, if you look at the optical surveys, this is the most successful op and the largest optical survey that has been carried out up to this point. So through this kind of selection, we are uh, we are selecting AGN, which has actually been un underrepresented even in large surveys like SDSS, right? So this is a nice, interesting parameter space that also uh, this uh, radio survey is opening. So there is also a very powerful synergy with uh, UGMRT here, which I want to demonstrate in this slide. So I was showing you that MALS through its L band and UHF receiver is actually looking at uh, this frequency range 0 to 1.5, whereas UGMRT has a much lower frequency coverage. So it is actually through this we can cover uh, this uh, additional higher shifts. And that's what we are trying to do. The sample that we are we are observing with MALS, these bright radio sources, we are also observing it with uh, UGMRT. And with, recently with UGMRT, we have detected one uh, rare absorber at redshift greater than two. This is the 21 centimeter profile shown here, and this is this is ha, has a flux density of about 200 millijansky and appears very compact if you look at uh, uh, re resolution of uh, GMRT, which is like about uh, six arc seconds, right? But when you look at it in VLBI, which gives you a resolution of milli arc second scales, and, and this will, is revealing the radio morphology of this source at parsec scales, you found you see that this actually has got a very diffuse morphology here. What is it, this is showing here is that the radio emission that against which we are seeing absorption is actually very diffuse and it's spread over a few tens of parsec to 10 kiloparsec. So this means that we are, this absorption is actually not coming from a one or two clouds uh, towards a very compact radio source, but it's actually a, a screen of cold gas that we are observing here. So what the way you want to visualize here is that this radio source is actually embedded in a large reservoir of cold gas. So such uh, radio sources are actually, uh, uh, you can think of it, they're passing through a very rare evolutionary stage of the AGN evolution. Like so AGN, AGN, when the AGN is born, it's actually shrouded in a very dust, uh, dusty environment. And when and through the AGN activity and perhaps also uh, impact of the radio jets, it clears this uh, uh, dusty uh, environment and then starts shining the way we look at them in optical and ultraviolet wavelengths. So, that, so all that, so we are seeing this AGN is, is, is a little before it has cleared this environment, right? And uh, another uh, very interesting object that we have detected uh, recently is an AGN at redshift uh, greater than five. Again, in this case, when we do VLBI, we find that uh, it, uh, you, you, you would think that this is actually looks like a standard AGN where there is a core here, where there is uh, these are hot spots on the both sides, right? AGN core and two hot spots on the other side. That's how a standard FR2 radio source may look like. But again, when we uh, take into account the what fraction of uh, flux density that we're detecting here, it's actually just only 20% of the total flux density that this radio source possesses, which means that again, there's a large scale diffuse emission that is present in this radio source as well. So while this one is uh, interested, uh, this target is interest, interesting to just look at the evolution of young radio source. This one, uh, in this case, it also becomes more interesting because this also happens to be a very uh, at very high redshift. And so, so just from the time scales perspective, like of the black hole uh, evolution, it, it becomes very interesting object to study. So now I'm going back to uh, the data processing, archiving and distribution challenge that uh, Mal's uh, for this. And, and then again, I will switch back to the kind of science uh, that we are getting from Mal's. 
So as I was describing that one hour of mouse produces, uh, Meerkat observation produces one terabyte of raw data. And, and all this uh, data processing, archive and distribution is happening at Ayuka. And this is, uh, and we have set up this whole thing, uh, the whole en en environment what we, for archiving, and processing and uh, distribution like this. Uh, you, you can see it from bottom upwards here. So we have a setup. We have we have a, a specialized cluster for mouse. It consists of 16 nodes. The entire architecture is defined here. I am not going into uh, complete details of it. But uh, what, what happens here, like the as, as I was telling you, that mouse team is actually geographically distributed. So any of our team members can connect to our cluster. All the data that comes from South Africa, it comes on uh, LTO7 tapes. Each tape can have about five terabytes of data, so corresponds to kind of one a couple of observations. It comes to Ayuka, it gets loaded onto the cluster, then it is ready for processing. And then we have uh, set up an automated uh, data processing pipeline, which I will talk about in the next slide, which can do calibration, flagging, and imaging. Imaging for uh, making uh, large spectral line cubes, as well as the quantum images that I was uh, talking about, these can be made. And then they become available for our uh, team members to analyze, uh, to detect various galaxies or spectral, spectral lines that they would want to do. And, and, and this is a huge effort. We have been developing this pipeline and setting up this environment over the last five years. And we have done this in collaboration with uh, Software Industry in India. We have been fortunate to have uh, an excellent team from ThoughtWorks. It's a private uh, software company based in Pune. And plus, uh, we have set up this in, uh, in in a very matured computing environment, which Ayuka has. Ayuka has a very uh, well uh, developed, very versatile uh, HPC facility. And, and, and we have a team, uh, in-house team, which is uh, very uh, much an expert in HPC as, uh, concepts. So, so this is the environment in which this uh, data processing is taking place. Now uh, to talk a little bit more about uh, the data processing challenge. So as I was telling you that we have, uh, uh, in the end we will have, we will accumulate uh, a, a entire data volume of 1.7 petabyte. That is just the raw data, right? So if, and we are observing 500 pointings over, uh, 500 to 500 total thousand pointings over a period of four years. So if you, without doing any uh, uh, detailed calculation, you can say that like that the, the the basic data processing challenge that we have is that we should be able to process one pointing per day, right? You have thousand pointings and you're talking about observing them over a period of three years and this data are coming to you periodically. So if you want to keep up with the data at, at the rate at which arriving you, you should be able to process one pointing per day. So, so that is the basic uh, objective that we have, that we, uh, we must have enough computing resources that we are able to achieve this. So for each pointing in a day, we should be able to produce uh, all the quantum images and spectral line cubes that we have, right? So our pipeline is basically uses uh, Python and it uses uh, CASA software, a lot of our custom code to take care of flagging and also different partition schemes for uh, uh, continuum and spectral line imaging. And, and then once the images are made, uh, then you have to, uh, in an automatic fashion, detect those continuum sources, AGN star forming galaxies, characterize them. And then if they are looking at spectra, then you have to identify uh, various spe spectral line features, make catalog of them and, 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 and save them in some kind of a standard database which can then be used. So if, if you're interested in looking at it in more detail, then you can, uh, all the details are published in this paper. You can look at it. I, I will, uh, as I go through some of the subsequent slides, I will I will highlight some of the aspects, but not go in great details of it. Of course, some of it we can get back to when we are actually having question answers. So this is uh, now uh, uh, giving a little bit more detail of spectral line uh, analysis here, right? So as I was saying, calibrated visibilities will be 1.7 petabyte. So each spectral line cube that we are going to make, what we are going to do is that we are taking this 32 k bandwidth and we are splitting it to 15 channel, uh, 15 uh, spectral windows and each one of them here as you can see in the screen gets uh, processed pa in, a, in a parallel manner and then we have a spectral line cube corresponding to each one of them so each cube is actually uh, 300 terabytes large right so just to store each spectral line cube we need a storage of five petabytes of course we don't store all of them forever 
we will make them we will extract the information that we need and we will delete some of them because uh, they can be recreated uh, again in future if we need so the processing that we need uh, for this is equivalent to 4 million core hours right and and, and what and what is the core corresponding to is described here we are talking about uh, one compute node of our cluster. It has six total 16. One node is actually a Xeon Gold 6126 processor. So uh, and it has a 384 GB memory per node, right? So so that's so so these are the specifications which refer to these uh, core hours. So all this is based on uh, back of the envelope calculation plus actual experimentation that we have done. Uh, on our cluster so this storage uh, again like if you want to have several petabytes of storage uh, uh, of and you want to do a lot of computing you have what you have to do is like you have to build what is called multi-layer storage so uh, we have got four petabyte of fast ddn storage uh, on our cluster this is like to feed uh, nodes uh, rapidly and then uh, some archival storage which comes in uh, the form of disks so this is much slower this cannot keep up with the I.O. that in uh, a compute node requires, so you don't use it for compute, but you keep it for somewhat archival. And then, of course, when we have done a lot of other things, but we don't want to delete them, we want to keep them for longer archiving, then that kind of storage will happen on tapes, right? So this is how the entire kind of 10, 12 petabytes will be split over, uh, uh, like, uh, over these multiple layers, because as you go for the slower storage, it gets cheaper. Uh, but you want fast storage because you want to compute, right? So that's the basic idea here. So, so this is uh, these are some of the first spectra that we have taken with uh, for for Mal's project. You can look at here. This is uh, am I audible teeth here? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, my phone was ringing, so I was I just wondered in case someone is trying to contact me or for some reason. OK, so I'll continue. So this is the first spectra uh, that we took for uh, MALS. Uh, this is uh, a very famous uh, radio source, PKS 1830-211. It's a Tenjansky source, which is actually at redshift of 2.5. It's very special because it's a strongly gravitationally lens, but it also has multiple absorbers uh, already. So it's a very nice target which you can observe uh, because it is very strong, so it will expose uh, instabilities of your uh, system. Plus, also it has got multiple absorption lines, so you would want to reproduce them because you have got an instrument. You want to check whether it's working fine or not. So we observed, we detected these known absorption lines. But since with MeerKat, as I was telling you, that MeerKat is actually the most sensitive radio telescope at centimeter wavelengths, and, and any spectra that we take, we we are bound to detect some things which are new. So in this case, what happened that OH main lines, and I will describe what OH main lines are, uh, were detected, uh, but we also detected what we call uh, the satellite lines corresponding to it. So these are the highest redshift detections of these satellite lines. So now to tell you what OH main and satellite lines are, when we look at OH 18 centimeter lines, it's actually not one line, it is a set of four lines, right? Which happen at 1667, 1665, 1612, and 1720 megahertz. And if these are in local thermodynamic equilibrium, this is how the strength of these uh, four lines will be. 9 is to 5 is to 1 is to 1. So 1667 megahertz line will be strong. So previously 1667 and 1665 megahertz lines were already known. These are called main lines. And the other two are called satellite lines, right? So the main, so, so when we detected these two, first question you can ask whether they are in local thermodynamic equilibrium or not. We find that they are. But when we look at 1612 megahertz line and we try to predict its strength on the basis of LT ratio, we find that it's actually fall, fall short. You can look at this black curve here, right? You can, it, it, account, it can account only for 60% of the uh, total uh, absorption that we are seeing. So what this tells you is that there is actually a non-thermal component. And also further, when you look at 720 megahertz line, you find that actually a part of it is appearing in absorption and a part of it is actually appearing in emission. So what happens in case of these satellite lines is that uh, they get uh, excited through two uh, different channels. One is happening at 119 micron, another 79 micron. And depending on uh, which one, uh, these two competing channels, which one is actually dominant, uh, a, a particular line can emit, appear in emission, other one can appear in uh, absorption. So, so this becomes a very powerful tool to actually trace the kind of uh, conditions, physical conditions which are there in the dusty environments, right? 
So another thing which we could do for this uh, particular sight line is, is that uh, if you look at this radio source at centimeter wavelength, it's a gravitational lens source. It has got these two compact components, but these are also embedded in this very diffuse Einstein ring. Right. But if you look at it at very high frequency, it's actually uh, corresponding to these very compact components. Right. So when we look at this ALMA spectrum, which is at very high frequency, you see this very narrow absorption features of these molecules. But, but you also see this uh, very uh, like high velocity features here as well. These correspond to probably tidal debris or high velocity clouds in the absorbing galaxy. But when we look at its low frequency absorption line, which is H121 centimeter here and OH18 centimeter line, you see this very smooth broad absorption. So what's happening here in at low frequencies is that not only that your emission is radio emission, the background radio emission is very smoothly distributed. So you are actually looking at more of the galaxy, sampling more of its galaxy. But also at uh, these wavelengths, the H1 and OH gas that we are looking at from which these absorptions are arising, they actually have much larger uh, velocity dispersion. So that's why you are seeing this uh, absorption line, which are being very smooth. So if so, this, so this is a very good example, like even though you are looking at uh, like this galaxy in just in absorption, but the fact that you have got very high quality data at multiple frequencies, you can actually start modeling what the, the distribution of gas in the galaxy as well. Right. So I have, since I have spent so much time talking about OH, uh, it, it is actually a reasonable question to ask what kind of OH yield that we may uh, detect from our survey. So this is something we have tried to model with uh, Sergey Balashe in, in diffuse ISM. Uh, Hello. Neeraj, you are getting muted once in a while. Uh, now we cannot hear you. I think you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I, I have unmuted myself now. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Please carry on. Okay, so how much did you miss actually? Uh, yeah, I mean, this slide with the beginning we got. but Okay, maybe. perfect then. Not, not, not much actually. I don't know why that happened. So, uh, so I was just talking about the OH yield. So I was telling that. So I was telling that I am now getting begin to get an echo also. Echo. Uh, can you speak again? Uh, uh, hi, Teeth. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Now. It's okay. Right. Now it's fine. Now I'm not getting an echo. So I was talking. So I will try to go through uh, this a little quickly now. Uh, so, through a very simple prescription H2, using H2 observations, we can predict what is the o OH yield. And why I'm talking about H2? Because at higher redshift, uh, uh, about three, H2 can be observed uh, through optical telescopes and diffuse ISM, right? And those observations exist, and we can use them to then predict what would be the o OH yield from the radio surveys. And what we find that, uh, like, uh, from uh, let's say BALS, which would cover a shift range of zero to two, we, we expect to detect about a, a handful of OH absorbers. So this is, you would argue that this is a kind of survey which is like more tuned to the requirements of SK1, but this is something we will be explicitly testing with BALS because uh, uh, there are two caveats here. One is that we are basing our uh, statistics on optical surveys and observations at redshift of three. And if you look at the evolution of star formation rate density, just from th this, you would expect that there is perhaps more cold gas as you come to it, more intermediate redshifts. And second thing is that optical these optical surveys may be affected by dust fires. So in both the cases, it's possible that what we are estimating from our uh, calculations here is actually under uh, uh, is a is a lower limit, right? So. Since MALS has got such a such an excellent uh, uh, spectral line sensitivity, uh, what happens that up to redshift of 0.1, we can actually detect galaxies directly in H121 centimeter line emission as well. So these two slides, uh, these two panels here are actually showing an example of that. You can see faint green contours in each one of them actually overlaid, and these are actually H121 centimeter emission directly from uh, these galaxies. So what we're doing here to various PhD projects uh, based here at Ayuka and in South Africa to, to make a connection between uh, like if, if, if this is how the H1 emission is distributed in a galaxy, then in, in, then in, in, in which regions actually the gas is cold, right? Because what you want to understand through this observation that how galaxy accretes gas and 
through which channels it actually uh, gets converted into coal gas and then subsequently the molecular gas and then becomes a fuel for the star formation. And another thing that we can do uh, from MALS because we are not only detecting H1 in emission from these galaxies, but we are also actually resolving this H1 emission. In fact, there will be a few uh, hundred galaxies for which we will have uh, uh, more than five beam across, which means that we can actually resolve the, the kinematics in the galaxy. We will be able to tell how uh, measure what is the uh, specific angular momentum of these H1 disks, whether these H1 disks have got warps or not. So this is something which is very in interesting uh, from the perspective of understanding how the H1 disks in these galaxies work built up and how they are actually even related to the large scale structure in which uh, they are residing. So, so, so this is another aspect of uh, spectral line uh, of MALS. And uh, as I was saying that we have got very nice synergy with various uh, uh, multi-wavelength surveys. We have aligned our pointings to what is called cosmic ultraviolet baryon survey. This is a large project which is uh, ongoing with HST. And this is to look for uh, galaxies in redshift range of 0.4 to 1, but Serendi Petersley, they detected a DLA at low redshift here. You can see damped Lamfa absorber I was showing in my example slide also. Here, right? Uh, so this in this, this is a, this is the quasar towards which this DLA is detected. And you would say that key, this is a nearby galaxy from which it is being produced here. But when we look at it in, with MECAD, uh, we find that this is the H1 profile here, right? H1 emission from, you can see that this entire, uh, this, uh, this whole galaxy is uh, this galaxy pair is actually embedded in, uh, in, in, in in H1 emission. They are actually interacting, which is something you would not have been able to infer just from these optical images. Right? So this is how, like, when you combine data from multiple wavelengths, you are able to uh, complete the picture. This, 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 this is one of the things that I was trying to describe. Another thing that we uh, do with MALS uh, is that uh, each of these sight lines that we are looking at, these are all aging at higher shift, but the sight lines also passing through uh, the galactic halo. So this is the distribution of pointings uh, plotted here in the galactic coordinates, right? So what we are going to do uh, with this survey is to provide a very uh, nice measure of how the CNM WNM is distributed in the galactic halo. So this is, this is a very nice uh, uh, complementary project that is being uh, carried out with MALS. So this is now brings me to my last slide where I present a summary. So I have exposed a, a lot of things, uh, but if you want, I, I, I'll give you two, uh, like while you read this, I'll give you uh, two uh, brief summaries. First is that I have demonstrated the uh, and data challenge, which is like uh, emanates from the simple fact that we have 1.5 petabytes of raw data accumulated over a period of three years, which needs to be brought to from South Africa to India at Ayuka and processed. And, and when we process it, it actually explodes to data products, which amounts to something like 10 petabytes. And then it all needs to be analyzed to derive the properties of galaxies, spectral lines, continuum sources, everything, right? Uh, so, so that is one challenge that, uh, or one aspect of uh, my presentation. And then and the second aspect is that we are carrying out uh, a, this uh, fantastic project, which will provide us a dust unbiased view of uh, uh, coal gas in galaxies over a redshift range of zero to two. Plus it is also a very uh, competitive H121 centimeter emission line survey through which we can actually understand the environments of galaxies where how the galaxies are acquiring gas from the environment and how it gets converted into coal gas. That's one thing. And, and, and something that I have not talked about today at all, because that was not the focus of my talk, that we will also have this very deep uh, continuum images in Stokes Eye and also in full polarization. And, and, and there's a whole range of continuum science that will also get done with it. So, but, but none of this will get done if we don't actually plan in, well in advance uh, to deal with these large volumes of data. Right, and it also gets a lot of uh, contributions from engineers at Sarao, for example, who are building this telescope. Engineers and commissioning teams who commission uh, these instruments, and then uh, 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 the computing team at Ayuka uh, and also the software industry, industry partner we collaborate with to put together this whole thing so that this can be done. Uh, in, in, in a competitive manner, because right, if you do this project over three years, you want everything to be done in three to four years, right? Because uh, only then the, uh, the science that you do remains relevant. Thanks a lot. That's where I will stop.
we can take some questions if there is time yeah thanks thanks a lot neeraj very impressive results so i can already see uh, hands up so let's go uh, shubham bharat baj please go ahead with your question thank you thank you sir uh thank you professor neeraj uh, that's what a wonderful talk actually uh, i worked uh, uh, on a similar project uh, in my masters uh, only one year research project so but that was not on radio it was on uh, using hst cos and the muse data for galaxy so can you please uh, go a little bit up to the slide where you were showing the uh, uh, lines and there was lt actually i missed a little bit my internet got okay Uh, is my screen still shared? I uh, I'm not. Yeah 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 yeah. Yes yes. Okay. Yeah, this is the one. This yeah this one this one. So yes. what this LT is like? Uh, it's a local thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, okay. So in this, uh, sir, I have a few questions. Like there are different lines. Like uh, I see the absorption features, and uh, there are this blue lines. Are these the like uh, you're fitting these lines, or these are the fitting lines, right? So you can see. Uh, so uh, let me zoom it a bit here. So yeah. you can see uh, in blue, dark blue here, the histogram. Yeah. That's the observed profile, right? Yeah, yeah. And then you can model them as a, a set of Gaussians, right? Yeah. And why you are fitting this uh, with Gaussians is to be able to uh, parameterize the profile much better, so that you can model them. You are not necessarily thinking that if since there are three Gaussians, there are three clouds, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, So, sir, you are uh, using only one profile to model this, like the. Uh, no, you are you you fit them simultaneously. You you fit two male lines simultaneously. You, I ideally you fit all four of them simultaneously, and but since uh, you can see the sixteen twelve megahertz has got an additional non thermal component, it will not get fitted simultaneously. So you have to add another component to it to explain it, and then seventeen twenty megahertz is actually more complex because uh, it's it, half of it is the emission and half of it is an absorption. So, so you try to uh, model them simultaneously to get a consistent picture. Yeah, yeah, it's a multi-phase uh, modeling, multi-component modeling, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, actually, I I also did the same project, and we use. So, sorry, sorry part. to guard it. Do you have a specific question? Uh, yeah, other yes, sir. Yeah. Take the discussion later. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, and sir, you said uh, you can do the modeling of the cloud. So, uh, for that, like, uh, how you are doing the modeling of the clouds? Like, so you can, uh, I think you can look at this paper in detail. Actually, this Combs et al. Twenty uh, one. Uh, you can look at this uh, in detail. This this one, yeah, right? You you there are a lot of details given there. Uh, you can uh, you can read that, and if you have some questions, you can contact me. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Let's let's move on to the next question then. Uh, Shumanto Rai, please go ahead. Shumanto, can you unmute yourself and ask the question? Yes, yeah. sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for such an informative uh, session. But uh, my question is that, uh, in order to fill up the feedback form, we have uh, there is a thing to uh, like mention the organization name. So if someone doesn't have an organization that he or she is affiliated to, so uh, you, you write uh, independent. You can write uh, oh. not affiliated or independent, whatever you want. Yeah, oh. sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, please ask questions relevant to this talk. Sorry, uh, Vrishal. Please go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so basically, my question is: uh, so when we are, uh, if we want to observe a galaxy which is uh, which is located beside the sun, so uh, there will be radio disturbances because of so the solar radiations. Then how could we eliminate that and seek the required data? Oh, very. Uh, that's very easy uh, because uh, sun moves in the sky, right? Yes, yes. So you can observe that galaxy at a time when sun is not close to it. In fact, we should plan our observations such that the sun is not very close to our observation because sun is a very strong source, and you yes. would be able to get useful data. It's very easy; it's not a hard problem. You okay. know that, right? Yes, sun is moving yes, so yes, fast. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Rohit Nair, please go ahead. Am I audible, sir? Yes, please, please carry on. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, I have Thank a question you. regarding a software uh, which mm -hmm. is called. Carta, something cube analysis and renting tool for astronomy. So you have yes. any idea about it? How it yes. is used in SK? Yes. Uh, so so Carta is uh, a tool which is written to visualize uh, 
images and data cubes which are very large so so yeah you can install it on your laptop or desktop whatever you have and if you have a radio image uh, the, and you can uh, load it and it will the, the way it is better than pre previous other similar softwares is that uh, in it can uh, in a, in a matter of few seconds it can load it the spectral line cube which is let's say 100 200 gigabytes right okay sir sir i have one more question it might uh, be simple but uh, can you uh, give importance about lower frequency radio astronomy and higher frequency radio astronomy like which events are associated with those type of astronomy frequency? so see, uh, for example uh, it, it is very easy to uh, illustrate this uh, using this slide for example uh, Uh, especially in case of spectral lines, you know the spectral lines happen at uh, specific frequencies, right? So yes. H one twenty one centimeter and O H lines we can observe at these corresponding to centimeter wavelengths, right? And yes. whereas uh, here you are looking at H C O plus, H two O, C H plus, R N H plus, these are the lines which are actually corresponding to uh, uh, at millimeter frequency. So you are talking about hundred gigahertz and upwards, right? So yes, yes, yes. So, so this is high frequency. so but these tracers which you are seeing here which are shaded in yellow these are corresponding to dense gas in 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 the ism right okay. whereas h121 okay. cm and oh that we are seeing here they would could come from both dense and diffuse right so yes. now if you observe both of them uh, together then you can understand like uh, the absorbing medium that you are seeing what uh, its physics can be modeled much better right so this is for spectral line now if you go go to a much broader scale like you are talking about quantum uh, science then uh, you would be wanting to uh, let's say you are observing a galaxy or an agn you would want to observe its radio emission at different frequencies let's say starting from 100 megahertz and go up to 100 gigahertz for example right uh, okay and using that then you can actually model the ionized gas which is there in uh, in, in the source which is actually uh, giving rise to uh, this radio emission in the sense that you can uh, start modeling whether it is coming from synchrotron whether it is coming from free free emission right bremsstrahlung uh, they are both different mechanisms right in one case you have these electrons which are uh, getting influenced by the magnetic field right yes yes the, the other one is free free emission that's that's different so so like that you can uh, so you have to have so it is it is so you can say that at some wavelengths you can do some things which are unique but at the same time you have to observe at multiple wavelengths to build the full picture okay yeah i can see many hands up but we will take a couple only uh, for the timing prerna bishwas please uh, ask your question yeah please go ahead Okay. Um, thank you, Niraj. Uh, that was a wonderful talk and also an interesting Thanks. project. Um, my question is: in, you may have mentioned it somewhere, but I uh, didn't understand quite well. Uh, you said that uh, the project involves the evolution of the cold gas in the galaxies. So, how you are uh, separating this cold and warm component for these galaxies? So, what happens? So, if we are, if I'm just talking about absorption, and I go back to uh, the slide here uh, yeah. so what we can use uh, what, what we can so so we are looking at it statistically that that would be the simplest way to understand so for example like we do this survey and and 21 cm absorption is actually inversely weighted with respect to the spin temperature of the gas which means mm -hmm. that it is more sensitive to cold gas than the warm gas okay yeah. so mm -hmm. it's so using this uh, we can determine a, occurrence of 21 cm absorption as a function of redshift right and that can then right. be con converted into the cnm filling factor of galaxies oh. right and then it can okay. then be related to the other global observables like star formation rate density of the universe and uh, and, and maybe other properties uh, of the galaxies also need to be taken into account because uh, it it can because one is in uh, simplistically we may anticipate that more cold gas may mean more star formation but it's also possible that the more star formation will also mean more feedback right mm -hmm. yes. so so where that uh, where is it that uh, gas located or what is its ambient environment is also going to play an important role so 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 through this modeling we have to then understand 
that uh, how this is getting related to star formation right it, it, it need not be a simple one is to one relation you have to take into account the complexity that may come due to feedback as well okay okay, okay. but in one is to one Thank cases you. like this you can uh, uh, you, uh, where you have uh, access to multiple tracers like this you can you can model them uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in okay the, uh, okay we can go to the final question. Uh, Mohit, uh, please unmute and ask the question. I have just basic, just few basic questions. What is the size of the pointing? Individual point? Size of the? Pointings. Okay, size, uh, you, the field of view is one, one degree at 1.4 gigahertz. That's full width of half maximum. And of course, like as, since we cover up to 580 megahertz, it increases proportionally in the okay okay sir i have one more question as, as you said is the casa will able to do the direction dependent calibration so direction dependent calibration is a very generic term it has uh, it, it it means different things to different people in casa so the the simplest of it is correcting from the primary beam effects right and in case of wideband imaging, the primary beam is actually changing as a function of frequency, right? So yeah. this effect you can correct for in using CASA, that's one effect. And second effect is that your point spread function is actually not same at the different uh, locations in your primary beam. That's like your W projection, right? Uh, correcting for the W term, if you're familiar with this, then that can also corrected, be corrected in CASA. So yeah, these are the direction different effects that you can correct in CASA. But then there can be more effects like, for example, ionosphere. That is something I don't think so implemented in CASA in that manner. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Sir. Okay, I, I'm sorry. We have to now uh, close this session and move on. But let me again uh, thank Neeraj.